us. And responding to it, spinning off the services, and meanwhile, your, your taxes and spending skyrockets. Now, that hospital example is recent. It just happened in Maricopa County. Maricopa Health Center was spun off in 2005. Here's another reason why you need to restrain local government. Local government growth of employees and local government is blowing by the federal government, at least until this year. Uh, yeah, I think Barack Obama thought that was a personal challenge to, to me. But I think it's important to really emphasize this. Uh, here is the federal payroll. Here is the Arizona local government payroll. Here's population inflation growth. This is the last year of these years where you have population inflation or the federal payroll growing faster than Arizona's local government employees. And you see, local government employees are growing much, much faster. So again, you create local governments that are bigger than entire states, bigger than counties, or at least equal, I mean, bigger to countries. You don't give them any real restraints on their powers, and look what happens. Let's go to the next thing. Now this is where your lives are going to be affected. Because when you hire all these government employees, they get Cadillac benefits. They get pension benefits out the wazoo. I mean, literally 20 years in, and they'll be making, what, 80% of, of their salary after they put 20 years in doing nothing. And then oftentimes they're rehired as a new employee. So they're simultaneously getting their retirement as they're working as, another, as a government employee. Uh, so the thing to understand about this is when you hire all these, these employees, you're creating an obligation to fund all these benefit plans. And in theory, there's supposed to be a trust fund where you're putting money aside. Well, the trust fund did not have a deficit between 1995 and 2003. But ever since then, and this is a, this is a particular trust fund where it deals only with police and fire, and 90% of this is local government. Even before the crash, it was a deficit $2.5 now, the reason why this is significant is because after the crash, there, there were times when this fund was only 50% funded, if you look at the market value. That meant that there were 50% of the obligations to pay benefits with no money to back. If this happened in the private sector, if you tried to run a pension fund like this, you'd be in jail. And at some point, this is going to catch up. And the only thing that cities can do is either fire people or raise taxes. Now, looking at the track record of hiring people, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to raise taxes dramatically. Or go bankrupt. This is why you need to look at these, your local government systematically. I'm just going to go through a few of the concepts. The report that I keep putting at the bottom here lays out 10, what I call 10 rights to restrain government and protect freedom. And the, the, the capstone right is the right to a presumption of liberty. And I borrow that from a, a, a professor that, if you ever do read anything in, in legal theory, you ought to read this. It's Randy Barnett. And what he did was he looked at the American Constitution, and he looked at case law interpreting it, he looked at the philosophy underpinning the American Constitution, and he said, you know what? The essence of the American experiment, the essence of American law is that you are presumed free by the law. It's like you're presumed innocent. You're presumed free. You don't need to be seeking out a permit to do things. You're presumed free. That idea is going by the wayside. I mean, literally, you can look into your local government ordinances, and in places like Mesa or Gilbert, if you, look, if you want to put up a sign, there's literally a part of their sign code that says, you are not permitted to put up a sign unless you can find a law that authorizes you to put up a sign. Right? I mean, th this is fundamental freedom of expression. We have completely flipped this, and, and this idea that everything you do needs to be permitted in some fashion is an idea that really originates in local government. And it, I want you to think about it as you go out into the world and you wonder what happens to a society where day in and day out, just to earn an honest living, just to do basic things like put a sign in your business's window, you have to curry favor with a government official every day. Right? What are you grooming in terms of your citizens? Well, here's one fix that I argue for. A big problem with regulatory approval is very often bureaucrats are afraid of doing anything. So they get another application that might be a little bit uh, you know, tricky, and they sit on it. They do nothing. And literally, in 
this case, this is my uh, landscaper. They sat on his application to build, a building application to build a spec home, which is a previously approved type of home that they'd seen before that, and, and had approved. They sat on his application for about 180 days. And that spelled the difference between him going bankrupt or building a home that he could sell because it happened right at the point where the bubble popped. So these have real consequences. And what I suggest is simply requiring approval within a deadline. And if they don't act on it, it's automatically approved. Because the whole idea of, re of regulation, if you believe it's justified in this instance, is that you're not prohibiting, right? You're not satiating a bureaucrat's fear of consequences or being held accountable. You are supposed to be bringing order to a presumably dangerous thing. And at some point, you're going to allow it to happen. Well, let's put some teeth in that. Put a deadline in, approve it if it doesn't get approved within the time frame. Now, there are some things that shouldn't be regulated at all. And as I've alluded to it, sign regulations. I don't understand them. I don't know where this obsession with clutter of signs comes from. I mean, if you, if you read an ordinance, I think there's more energy that goes into regulating signage than just about anything else a local government does. I don't understand it. I, I mean, I, I still can't. I, I don't run into people who are just like, signs! You know, I, I, <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know, let's face it, there's some things that shouldn't be, shouldn't be regulated at all. And here's a good, exa a good example. One of our donors, a very generous guy named Fred Nock, uh, runs a business. He, he, he certifies the safety of high-pressure uh, uh, what boilers, uh, uh, high-pressure chemical carriers, you know, these, these things that, that are basically, you know, what you put natural gas in. And, uh, and he bought a place, and it looked like this. <coughs> and being the, the generous guy he was, he had an idea. He thought he was going to give back. We all thought, you know, give back. You know, businessmen feel guilty about giving back. Well, he, you know, he, he felt like giving back. Let's see what he did. He hired a famous perspective artist who was painting the building in this perspective art style. <coughs> it looked like an ornate building from the 19th century. And this is in a, you know, in a industrial area, this is a, you know, not a special building. This is just something that's pleasant for the neighborhood, out of his own goodwill. So he, he had the guy do it. And next slide. Here's his reward. You see, let's see if you can think like a lawyer. Imagine you have a protruding part of the building, right? protruding part of the building, and you paint it. And there's a picture on it. Local level. Put this into the charter of your local government, but make it enforceable by the people. 